Yeah, that's a uh, 2009 toilet in some parts of Australia. This is called a crib, which is like a little, uh, like a prostitute's um, quarters that was rented out for, for 20 bucks a week. week. And, and an impatient line of men would wake up, wait outside, waiting, you know, for no service. No really? That's yeah. so cool. And it's a booked off holidays girlfriend and Wyatt Earp's second wife were uh, in the profession. <laughs> wow. Oh, there's the, also from the movie, Bottles of Laudanum. They called them soiled doves. And uh, a lot of them just ended up committing suicide by overdose. Gee, the men must have been pretty lousy. Yeah. <laughs> so Wait, did they have a no license tea. for this? What? Working. Big Thank nose. God, you think Doc could have done better than that? And here's where Red Light District came from. Apparently, it said during stopovers, the railroad engineer would leave his red lantern on the porch of the brothel he was patronising, so he could be located in an emergency. The madam soon realised that these red lanterns were good advertising and began using red lights to publicise their operation. Eventually, brothels were required by law to display red lights, thus establishing Red Light Districts. Said here, an oil cloth was spread across the bottom of the bed to keep the bedspread from being soiled by dirty boots or shoes. Although the men always removed their hats when entering, they seldom had enough time to take off their boots. Which brings a new meaning to the word quick and dirty. I don't think in mind that sounds like uh, not quite as bad as leaving socks on, I guess. <laughs> This here carbolic acid bottle. Many soiled doves kept a bottle of carbolic acid nearby as a disinfectant to prevent sexually transmitted diseases. In 1867, Joseph List had introduced carbolic acid in Britain as the first surgical disinfectant. Its use reduced surgical death rate from 50% to 15%. Listerine mouthwash was named after Lister. <laughs> It's a pink molten. What kind of molten is this? This is like the, is this the Pashley or is this the real this is deal? Pashley, this is TSR. Uh huh. And yeah. uh, how much does this sell for? Uh, 2,500. This, this is not a bike Friday. Oh no. no, no. It's Alex Molten. Sir, oh. Sir Alex. He's the uh, industrial designer, British industrial designer in Stratford upon Avon, who, who developed the. Um, the elastomeric suspension for Mini Coopers. Ken Wallace from the was it Bisbee Bicycle, Bicycle Brothel. brothel. Uh huh. So we remember him <laughs> from last. Bicycle Brothel. Ken from Bicycle Brothel is now talking about Bike Friday after all these years and of all the famous bikes he's got. That's pretty impressive. I've known a lot of people who've had like the very best Italian bikes, three or four of them. They'll buy a Bike Friday, and next thing you know. They've sold everything else. Phil so. Liggett taught you to be a commissaire, which is what's that? Uh, yeah. That's like the highest level of, of official, of bicycle race official. Well, since our last visit to the Bisbee Bicycle, bicycle Brothel, um, the place has expanded. It's actually moved. So all we can say is that business must be booming in the old bike business. Each one of these bikes has an incredible story. Um, Starting, a lot of them starting in a uh, garage sale or a yard sale, I understand. Uh, Point to the it. The Spenco 500 yeah. was 500 miles uh -huh. and the Spenco company sponsored it. Yeah. And I thought it was a piece of cake, I would win, and this Betsy King girl yeah. who had raced in the Tour de France showed up and beat me. By how much? 
second? Half an hour. But you came second? I was, yeah, it was an easy second. Easy second. But it was crazy, because where'd she come from? She wasn't an ultra rider, but she could ride 500 miles. There you go. So that how was 1984. But how long did it take you? Maybe 40, 42 hours. Oh my gosh. Lon, what are we looking at here? Well, I'm not sure if it, uh, well, this is a 1987 tandem transcontinental record with me and Pete Pinsir, seven days, 14 hours from Los Angeles to Atlantic City. Wow, 22 years. Yeah, 22 years ago. It still stands. It's, it's, the, it's the fastest human powered crossing of the country. And how many days? Seven days? Seven days, 14 hours. Probably Pete said if we had done it on singles, that translated to still about seven days, 20 hours, because we were about an hour faster per day than a single bike. Look, the bike riding head badge is still here. So I gave that to him last year, and it's good to see that it um, <clears throat> actually has a place in the cabinet. Well, this. Well, You've been thinking about it, have you? Eventually. Eventually. Well, they say the road to eventually leads to the town of nowhere. <laughs> so there's the traffic cone bag in non-traffic cone mode, right? <laughs> I got it to work. You got it to work? There you go. I love it. <laughs> so this is the scenic twisting road up to Mule Pass through Bisbee. to the top here. Now there's that house I really like. It's just a simple box with a door and a porch and a window. What do you need? Here's the traffic cone bags in action. <laughs> well this is Mule Pass or Pass as you say over here up over. The only serious climb in the whole tour. There's Bisbee far below us. I'm drafting on here, getting some good draft from those bags. <laughs> so Andreas and I on Pocket Rocket Pros are drafting Bobby here. We're wondering what she ate for breakfast. We can only assume it's because she ate opposite Lon and some of his ultra energy rubbed off. We don't know. But we're on Pocket Rocket Pros and she's on an upright tourist and we're behind her. <laughs> it's very cool. It was the longest hill here. Uh, she also tells me she didn't even touch the brakes and got up to 45 at about 38. What, a, what an animal! <laughs> so I just discovered the secret. Bobby was a downhill ski racer. That totally explains it. <laughs> so this is just nothing. This is just a walk, a walk in the park compared to her racing days.